Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Bruegel event that uh, will uh, discuss uh, about future of work. It's a quite fascinating topic. Uh, I'm Georgos Petropoulos, and I will be the moderator uh, for today. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, three distinguished uh, speakers uh, uh, from academia and policy making. Uh, that uh, they all made uh, some great contributions um, on the field. Uh, we have with us uh, David Otter, who is um, the fourth professor at the Department of Economics at uh, MIT. Uh, and um, David will present uh, his new paper, which is actually work in progress uh, on some great insights on uh, the implications of technology uh, on uh, the future of work underlying uh, the importance of technological innovations in generating a new uh, forms of work to create new work. And um, uh, of course, um, um, as uh, every great academic uh, research needs to be also analyzed uh, from a policy perspective, uh, to analyze the policy implications, to analyze uh, how such uh, findings can help us uh, as a society. And it's a great pleasure to have with us uh, Martin Gooch, uh, who is a professor of economics at Utrecht University and also an expert in this field. And uh, Barbara Kaufman, who is a director for employment and social governance at DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion at the European Commission. And uh, Barbara and her team is quite active uh, in this space uh, and also have their own uh, collection of data and research activities. Uh, so the idea is uh, to start with David's presentation and then to have a discussion on policy implications. Uh, before doing that, let me uh, say for our viewers uh, that uh, we will be very happy uh, if they are against by asking questions. How, the, how can they do that? Uh, they either can do the Slido platform, uh, sli.do, and uh, use the code WORK. Uh, in order to type their question. An alternative way to type their questions is uh, through um, the web page of this uh, webinar at uh, the Bruegel website. Uh, so stay with us, please ask questions and we'll have uh, time to discuss uh, hopefully the most of them by the end of uh, this event. Uh, feel free to ask your questions as we move forward, uh, not only at the discussion part. Uh, and uh, uh, without uh, having to add something, uh, David, it's a great pleasure. We we'll look forward to your insights. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward uh, to the questions and I appreciate uh, Martin and Barbara taking the time for this discussion and also to Georgios for uh, the invitation. So let me uh, share my screen. Um, here it comes. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about a, a new project I joined with Anna Solomons of Utrecht University and Brian Segmiller, who's a PhD student at the MIT Sloan School. And uh, this is about the origins and content of new work uh, over uh, 80 years. So let me let me motivate a little bit. Um, you know, we are in an era of uh, real concern about machine encroachment into uh, human activity. So this uh, recent book by the economist Daniel Sus Susskind of uh, Oxford Martin School uh, notes, you know, is automation crowding out human labor? Machines will not do everything in the future, but they will do more. And as they slowly but relentlessly take on more and more tasks, human beings will be forced to retreat to an ever shrinking set of activities. And you know, Suskin's comments actually, you know, are very much echo uh, what Vasily Leontiev said uh, nearly 40 years ago: um, progressive introduction of new computerized, automated, and robotized, robotized equipment can be expected to reduce the role of labor, similar to the process by which the introduction of tractors and other machineries first reduced and then completely eliminated horses and other draft animals. So this is a line of thinking with a you know a prestigious pedigree. <laughs> not to pun on the horse and horse point. Uh, and, uh, and, and let me be clear, this is distinct from the sort of widely ridiculed lump of labor idea that there's only so much work to do. And therefore when machines do more work, people do less. This is really a different point, which is about comparative advantage. That uh, the, the set of tasks in which people are more productive adjusted for costs than machines could be changing. And ultimately, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, 
non-zero cost to employing a person. They need to be fed, they need to be clothed, they need to be housed, and possibly everything that a person does could potentially be done by a machine, in which case there really wouldn't, it's not we'd run out of work, we'd just run out of work for people, just like we ran out of work for horses. Um, and uh, and there's, you know, there's a kind of a line of recent research uh, to which I've contributed, to which Martin has contributed, uh, that sort of, you know, explores this idea of machines encroaching on the comparative advantage of humans. Uh, and these often referred to as task models, technological progress, in which there's a finite set of tasks to do, not a finite amount of work, but they were com comprised of a, a certain set of activities. And uh, machines gain capabilities in those activities. And so they move people into a narrower set of activities in which they're more productive, potentially, but still there is this encroachment. Um, and uh, there's a lot of evidence that this is going on. We see a striking substitution of computers and robotics for directly affected occupations and industries or the decline of clerical work and uh, production work. A good ch chunk of that is automation. Um, and so uh, this notion of task encroachment, you know, has a lot of intuitive appeal. Simultaneously, there's a paradox here. You know, economists have thought forever that actually technological change is actually uh, enhancing work, right? It's making us wealthier. It's not eliminating us. It's in some sense increasing the value of our time uh, and increasing the value and the range of things that we can do. And so uh, it's, it's interesting that the economics profession has moved from a kind of position of extreme optimism about technological change in labor markets to one of rather you know, profound pessimism without you know, kind of rebalancing on, well, where did the other side of this go? And uh, in particular, if we think that you know, the process of technological progress you know, complements people, well, how does it do that? And how does it uh, change work in a way that makes people more productive as well as, making, uh, as eliminating some of the things they do? So, um, you know, one, uh, uh, a very important entry in this discussion is, is a paper by an economist named Jeffrey Lin of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia in 2011, who says, who makes the point, says, look, you know, you're thinking of machines encroaching on tasks done by people, but the set of tasks isn't actually fixed. Um, it changes over time. And he actually measures between that, over three decades using uh, census documents and we, from the US Census Bureau, which we will do as well, building on his work, and points out that there's a lot of new occupations that are emerging, emerging over time, things that didn't previously exist. And uh, this is an important idea because um, uh, it says that, well, we're not just eliminating things, we're also potentially creating things. And this actually, you know, has a lot of intuitive appeal, right? So if you think about it, uh, in the turn of the 20th century, in, a, you know, in uh, 1900 in the United States, 40% of employment was in agriculture. At present, less than 2% of employment is in agriculture. Do we actually think that people's work has gotten 38% narrower uh, in the intervening 120 years because they do less farming? Probably not, right? Because the range of new things that people do has actually, you know, the expertise, the technological expertise, expertise in medicine, in, uh, in uh, entertainment, in computing, and all kinds of things has expanded even as other things have contracted. And so this is the idea that we are focused on in this paper. Now, let me say this notion of new work, the emergence of new tasks has been sort of formalized and brought into a number of papers by Asimoglu, my colleague Daron Asimoglu and Pascual Restrepo who's also co-author of mine. Um, and they sort of say, well, you can think of this kind of, uh, if you like these two forces working in tandem. One is automation, which is taking tasks done by people and, and passing them and automating them so they're done by machines. And this is kind of making human labor more, uh, less re more redundant, less valuable, is that you might have another set of forces that are creating new tasks for people, what they call labor reinstatement, and those are restoring human comparative advantage. And so in combination, excuse me, my, okay, great. Uh, and so you could think of this kind of race going on between on the one hand, automation that's eliminating, making human labor more redundant, and uh, new task creation that is creating new work for humans. And maybe it, uh, what matters is the speed at which both those things occur. Um, however, we have very limited evidence on this empirically. Um, Asimov and Restrepo build on the work by Jeffrey Lin, but they don't uh, really expand on it. Uh, and, uh, so, and, and so the goal of this project uh, is one, uh, is to consider measure new work over these eight decades and see, well, where does it come from and what's in it uh, and, and what skills does it use? 
The second is to explore its technological and economic origins, meaning uh, what is its relationship to innovation and what is it re its relationship to economic incentives. And then thirdly, to analyze its relationship to employment and wages. Does new work, meaning new types of work, does it create more work or simply, you know, is it just changes in names? And does it create shifts in labor demand that actually augment workers and raise wages? Those are the questions you want to ask. So just to motivate this, uh, this is a, a, a picture of US employment in 1940 against 12 exhausted, mutually exclusive occupations that uh, uh, re organized from lowest paying on average to farm, which is farming and mining to highest paying, which is managerial work. And, and the, the heights of these bars are the counts of workers. So there are about 45 million uh, workers in the US labor market in 1940. And you can see that a very large chunk of them uh, more than a third are either in agriculture or in production work, in manufacturing effectively. Now they make that same figure for 2018. So some several things to notice here. First of all, the size of the U.S. labor force is about three times as large as it was in 1940. So it's gone from about 45 million to uh, about 150 million. Um, uh, second, some of the occupations that were largest in 1940 are actually smaller in numerical terms, not just in proportionate terms, but in numerical terms, right? So the number of agricultural workers has fallen from 7 million to about a half a million, or the number of production workers has fallen from about 11 million uh, to about 9 million. Simultaneously, there's been a huge amount of uh, additional employment in managerial work, in professional work, in office work, and also in personal services. The third thing I want to draw your attention to is this re green versus the red bar. The green bar is employment in 2018 in occupational titles, narrow jobs, and I'll explain more what I mean by that, that were present in 1940. The red part of the bar is new titles, new work that was has been added in the intervening eight decades. So what this says is that about two thirds of employment found in 2018 is in new types of work that were not present in 1940. Another way of saying that is, is almost all of the net additions to employment are additions through new work, uh, not through additions of jobs to uh, pre-existing work. And I'm going to be clear about what I mean by new work in a minute. So what we're trying to do in this, in this project is we want to say, uh, where does new work come from and what is it made up of? And there's really three parts to this. One is we have a, a set of hypotheses, which are formalized in the paper that you can't see. Uh, that links um, both uh, new task creation and task displacement to three forces. The first is technologies or innovations that complement the outputs of occupations. We're going to call those things augmentation, things that make the services created by an occupation more valuable or richer or more complex. And those are innovations that augment work. Second, we're going to look at technologies that substitute for the inputs of occupations that replace what people do. We're going to call that automation. So augmentation versus automation. These are two faces of innovation. And then the third thing is we're going to look at demand shifts that create incentives for automation or augmentation. In other words, exogenous technical forces, not technological forces, but having to do with supply and demand that create incentives to uh, augment work or to automate work. We're going to measure the emergence of new work uh, over these eight, eight decades, building on Jeffrey Lennon and document wh what it's done. It's just, and I think that provides a really interesting picture of uh, how the force of new work have changed over time. We're also going to measure these technologies that complement these occupational outputs that augment versus substitute for these occupational inputs, meaning they automate. And then we're going to test empirically, one, whether these augmentation innovations uh, and demand shifts affect the creation of new tasks, i.e. can we see where new tasks emerge? And then we're going to ask whether new task creation and task displacement, i.e. Uh, whether augmentation and automation affect employment and wages. And the key point we're going to make here is that it turns out that both augmentation and automation tend to occur in the same places. You'll find them in the same set of occupations, and yet they have different effects on employment and wages. Automation does seem to erode employment. Augmentation does seem to cause employment to grow. And simultaneously, automation tends to reduce wages and augmentation tends to raise wages. Uh, I'll put some caveats on that, but that is a, a key, key result. 
Okay, so let me now describe what I'm talking about in the remaining 18 minutes. First, I'm gonna tell you how we measure and describe, uh, measure new work and describe it. Then I'm gonna tell you how we distinguish task augmenting and task automating technologies. Um, then I'm gonna show you how uh, the new task creation is related to both innovation and economic incentives. Then I'm gonna show you or provide evidence on how this relates to overall changes in employment, overall changes in wages. So not just new work per se, but just the complete count, account, the gross change, uh, sorry, net change in work. And finally, I wanna uh, close by just giving a very brief example of why this might be uh, relevant even uh, in this very moment. Okay, so uh, a good chunk of the paper is about measurement. Uh, how you measure new work, how you measure augmenting technologies, how you measure automating technologies. And so there are three tributaries of information that we build on. Uh, here in this left time and side, we're going to measure new work. Uh, in the middle, we're going to measure augmenting technologies, or augmenting innovations. And in the right-hand side, we're going to measure automating in, uh, technologies. And I'll explain these latter two in a moment. And these all come together in our analysis. So the first thing is you need to understand how these three things are measured uh, to see, uh, to understand, uh, so I can explain how we use them. So to measure new occupations, the existence of new work, what we do is we draw on the census alphabetical index of occupations. This is a, a basically an internal document created by the US Census Bureau that's been created every decade uh, since 1900 effectively. And uh, what they do is it's a list of uh, 25 to 30,000 occupational titles that are used uh, uh, internally by the Census Bureau as a coding aid to census employees. So when you fill out, or if, you, if, you, if you're a US citizen, if you filled out the census or US resident, if you fill out the US census form, it asks you, what is your occupation? What is your industry? There's no checkbox or bubble for choose one of the following. You just write it in as free text. And then employees at the Census Bureau then have to figure out what code to assign it. And there are you know, three or 400 occupation codes in each decade, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of things that people could potentially write down. And so they create this, this index as a coding aid. Um, so each of the entries in this index has a, a name of a title. So someone could say they're an animator, they're an astrologer, they're a calligrapher, they're a clairvoyant. And then that gets an occupation code associated with it. Um, and uh, these are incredibly detailed. Right, so right here you see um, two different types of rodeo jobs, rodeo performer, rodeo rider. Um, you might find, uh, you know, multiple circus occupations, um, uh, multiple types of interpreter occupations and so on. So, um, uh, so this incredibly detailed list, but the key thing is the Census Bureau updates it every decade. When people write in something that they haven't seen much of before, eventually they notice and they create an entry in the census alphabetical index. And so we use the comparison of these indices from decade to decade between 1930 and the present to see what's been added. So for example, some job titles that were added between 1990 and 19, uh, 1980, 1990 are amusement park entertainers, uh, clairvoyants, those are people who see the future by the way, uh, rodeo performers uh, and sports announcers. Um, we uh, then, so we compare these to successive additions to identify the emergence of these new titles. And just to give you a sense of these titles, um, you might imagine a lot of them are technological in, in origin, right? People who create new technology, who install new technology, who, uh, you know, in integrate, who repair, who sell. And certainly we see a lot of things that look like that, right? So in 1940, automatic welding machine operators were added to the list or textile chemists or controllers of remotely piloted vehicles, or artificial intelligence specialists, or pediatric vascular surgeons. And you can see these are work, uh, these are new titles and they demand new expertise, right? They require people to learn a, a master a skill that wasn't previously present. So for example, being a pediatric vascular surgeon is obviously a, a highly trained occupation. It's not, just a, it's not just a narrow medical specialty, it's a deep medical specialty. And so these advances in technology or the advances in knowledge create new types of demands for expertise that cause new specialization that dry, uh, demand new skills. But similarly, at least, at least as many occupations do not have an obvious technological component. So acrobatic dancers, pageant directors, hypnotherapists, sommeliers, uh, drama therapists. And what these are often new services reflecting changing tastes, right? Or changing income levels 
or even changing demographics. Many new occupations are personal medical services or fitness trainers uh, or coaches for kids. Um, but again, we would argue that even though these are not necessarily as highly trained as pediatric vascular surgeons, they are new forms of work that require people to specialize, right? Being a tattooer, uh, you don't need a PhD to tattoo people, but you do need to, you do need to learn something uh, or to be a counselor or even to be a planner. So all of these are new things that for a while at least demand new specialized human expertise. Eventually some of them may go away, some of them may themselves be automated, but we think of these as uh, new types of work that are potentially uh, create new labor demand. Just, just to give you a sense of how this works over time, uh, I'm gonna compare two periods, 1940 to 1980 and 1980 to 2018. So in 19- if you look in that between these four decades, between 1940 and 1980, you can, we compare the stock of pre-existing work to the flow of new work. So in these decades, if you look at people with high school or lower education, the vast bulk of employment was in these middle skill, middle wage occupations, construction, transportation, production, and clerical office work. If you look at the flow of new work, the red bar, it's also concentrated in the middle of this figure, right? So this is where a lot of work exists for non-college workers, and this is where a lot of new work is being created. If you move forward to the next four decades, 1980 to 2018, you can see that a lot of the existing work is still in the middle, construction, transportation, production, and clerical. But the flow of new work is not. Uh, It's moved heavily to the tails, particularly the largest single category of new work using people uh, with high school or lower education is in personal services, typically low paid personal services. That's why they're on the left, with some smattering of other things, including some uh, professional managerial work. And so this shows you that new work has actually polarized. So people often talk about occupational polarization. You can see this is the leading edge of that phenomenon. If we make the same figure for college educated workers, some college or above, you can see even in 1940, 1980, it was heavily concentrated in professional and managerial work. And also notice there's a lot of new work in clerical work, right? Reflecting the rise of offices in this period. Uh, If you look in the subsequent four decades, new work using people with college educated, uh, college or above, uh, some college or above, is even more skewed to professional and managerial. It's growing in technical work, and noticeably, it's shrinking in clerical work, right? There's less new work in clerical work than there used to be, reflecting the fact that a lot of it is being automated away. Okay, Um, so now, so that's how we measure and describe new work. Now, let me tell you how we measure innovations that augment or automate labor. So this is actually uh, 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 interesting and, uh, and uh, we think quite useful. So we measure the flow of innovations uh, using patents. Uh, these are you know, utility patents that are applied for and awarded by the US uh, Patent Office. Uh, and often these are patents occurring worldwide. They're registered in the United States. And uh, we take the text of patents and we attempt to match them uh, or look for linkages um, to these descriptions, these occupational titles. So let me show you what I mean by that. So these are all these incredibly detailed occupational titles in the Census Alphabetical Index. And they describe the outputs created by workers or created by industries, right? So bookkeeping, um, tax tax consultation, uh, 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 check cashing or uh, auditing or letter of credit uh, creation, night auditing and so on. And we think of these as describing the occupational outputs. And when an innovation effectively links to these, we think is potentially augmenting those outputs, right? Creating more demand for them, adding value, changing the variety of things. Um, Conversely, when we look at things that substitute for occupational inputs, what we do is we use the dictionary of occupational titles, which describes the work that people do. And we look for patents that effectively report doing that work. So potentially, replacing the inputs done by people, right? So here's a bookkeeper, uh, keeps records, uh, verifies and allocates, uh, reconciles balances, uh, calculates wages, et cetera. And uh, these are things that we think of describing what people do. So these are on the left is our outputs, on the right are inputs. And the way we do this to try to find these linkages is we take all three of these documents, the, uh, the Substance Alphabetical Index, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles and these patents, we clean them in a way to make them suitable for machine, uh, for natural language processing. 
we uh, take, use a bunch of uh, contemporary techniques to kind of extract uh, meanings, meaning kind of synonyms and clusters of related words. And then we look for overlaps between the patents. And on the one hand, these things describing occupational outputs. On the other, these things describing occupational inputs. And we get a list for each occupation of how exposed they are either to augmentation or to automation. So the thing I want to emphasize here is we're using the exact same body of information, these patents, and we're looking to get two different components of variation out of those patents. One are things that appear to complement occupational outputs, and the other are things that appear to substitute occupational inputs. Um, but this is a actually a hands-off process. It's done by uh, you know effectively machine learning, uh, uh, and uh, and the key thing is we're using an entirely parallel set of techniques to look for these two different things. The only difference between them is for augmentation, we're targeting the words in the uh, these detailed uh, occupational descriptions, the type, the outputs. And for automation, we're targeting the words in the dictionary of occupational titles describing what people do. OK, so in the interest of time, I will not give examples. Let me just move forward. What I want to emphasize is that um, automation and augmentation uh, at the level of occupations are actually highly positively correlated. The like, so for example, uh, the occupation of power plant operator um, or assembler of electrical equipment, both there's a lot of automation going on in that occupation, but simultaneously there's a lot of augmentation. These are very positively correlated. But noticeably, there are things that are off the diagonal. So for example, if you look at typewriters and compositors or programmers of numerically controlled machines or cabinets and bench maker, cabinet makers, you'll see that these are exposed to a lot of automation, but not much augmentation, meaning we might expect them to contract over time. Conversely, if you look at mechanical engineers or operators and systems uh, research analysts, operations systems research analysts, you'll see they're exposed to some automation, but a lot of augmentation. So we might expect them to grow over time. So this is a key source of variation for our analysis. So now let me um, describe what we see in the data. So um, in the interest of time, let me, let me point out um, this shows you, I, I mentioned those 12 occupations at this outset, um, uh, describing you know, all of employment across these from lowest paying agriculture and mining to highest paying managers and executives. Within each of these, we show the, the, the detailed categories of work. We show how exposed they are to augmentation, uh, which is this x-axis. And then we look at the emergence of new titles. And sure enough, in, in 23 of 24 cases, wherever we see new augmentation patterns occurring, we see new titles emerging, right? So the flow of new work is predicted by the locus of where these augmentation innovations are occurring. Noticeably, this is not true for automation. So here I'm predicting the emergence of new titles. I won't go through the numbers. And you can see they're strongly predicted by augmentation patterns, but automation patterns do not have this property. Right? They do not predict the emergence of new human work. You could say they predict the emergence of new machine work, but we're not measuring that. <laughs> so in other words, although these patents are coming, we're identifying from the same place and they're co positively correlated, they have different properties. The ones that appear to be augmentation patents predict the emergence of new work for humans. The ones that appear to be automation patents do not predict the emergence of new titles for people. Um, but technology is not the only source of the emergence of new work. Some of it's gonna come directly from labor demand shifts. We expect that where there's an out, an in, a decline in labor demand, not only will there be fewer jobs, but there'll be fewer incentives to create new types of work that augment people. Um, conversely, where labor demand shifts outward, you would expect not only will be more work, but there'll be more new work. We test that in two different ways in the paper, but let me just mention one of them. We look at occupations that are particularly exposed to inward demand shifts resulting from rising trade pressure. And in particular, we look at occupations exposure to the China trade shock, which had a big impact on the US labor market in the early 2000s particularly. And I had very different impacts across different sectors. And so for example, you know, production work occupations were highly exposed, health service work occupations were not, but even within production, there was enormous variation. So textile workers were highly exposed to this trade shock, power plant operators were not. Or um, 
janitors among cleaning occupations and service occupations were relatively exposed to the trade shock because many of them worked in factories, whereas crossing guards who worked for schools were not. So we want to ask whether we see a slowdown in the emergence of new titles in occupations that are particularly ex uh, exposed to the China trade shock. And the short answer is yes. Uh, occupations, uh, so uh, occupations that were more exposed to the China trade shock in this period saw a slowdown in the emergence of new titles, even though those who were exposed to more patenting experience, uh, experience, continue to experience growth. So both of these things are happening simultaneously. And I can just say that, in fact, this pattern that we see in the period of the China trade shock was not visible in the prior decades. This is distinctive to that inward demand contraction. Um, in the paper, we also look at demographic shifts that also predict the emergence of new work. And is, uh, what's that's kind of nice is that it's not the same set of activities. Right, so a lot of the innovation is directed at things that look like uh, high tech activities. A lot of the demographic shifts having to do with population aging or the uh, uh, new birth cohorts are have to do much more to do with personal services. Okay, so now you might say, all right, great. So you can tell me where new jobs titles emerge, but who cares? Why does it matter? I don't care what title people have. I care how many jobs there are and what those jobs are paid. So um, we look at that in a couple of ways. The first thing we do is we look at employment growth within occupations and we see how it relates to uh, augmentation and automation. So what this figure shows you is that occupations that are exposed to more augmentation patents see relative growth of employment, conditional on automation. Similarly, conditional on augmentation, occupations that are exposed to more automation patents tend to contract. And let me say, this right-hand figure, we're not the first to discover this. A recent paper by Michael Webb, also work by uh, Lena Kogan and others, including Brian Segmiller, who's my, our co-author on this paper, also documents this thing on the right-hand side. What's new here is the thing on the left, that we can see the uh, things that predict the emergence of new, no, of new work, not just the elimination of old work. And then you might say, OK, well, that's jobs, but what about earnings? And here's what we try to do. So we want to look at both whether employment grows and whether earnings grow. It actually creates complexity because when employment grows in an occupation, you tend to get younger people in that occupation who are paid less. So you want to adjust for that. So let me show you how this plays out. So uh, on the left-hand side, we have the change in employment with occupations, and we have the degree of aug augmentation versus the degree of automation. So when this is positive, there's relatively more augmentation. When it's negative, there's rel relatively more automation. Right? So we can see occupations exposed to relatively more augmentation grow, those exposed to relatively more automation contract. If we look at the change in the composition of workers, you do get younger, lower paid workers in occupations that are augmenting and higher older paid older workers in automation occupations that are automating. However, once you adjust for the characteristics of those workers, you see that wages are growing among the groups exposed to augmentation and falling in relative terms among those exposed to automation. So although you are getting younger workers who have lower wages, they start to make more than you would predict in occupations that are exposed to more augmentation. So it does seem like although these automation and augmentation are occurring in the same set of occupations, they're having countervailing effects on both employment and earnings. So the invention of new work is important, not only for, for pushing out labor demand, measured both by the count of people and the earnings of people. So let me just conclude by giving you a, a recent example that highlights why this process is important. So you all have heard of uh, the COVID pandemic, I presume. Uh, and uh, we know that COVID is going to change the way people work. So for example, uh, people in uh, dense urban areas who work in dense urban areas, they spend a lot more uh, near their offices. So if you work in a, in a, a high dense city, you might spend $300 a week near your office, like taking people out to dinner, uh, you know, going out to coffee and lunch. And if you're in a low density area, you might spend a third of that. This is work by Barraro, Bloom and Davis. We also know that employers plan for these workers in these dense urban areas to be working a lot more from home after the pandemic. So they anticipate that about a third of their hours or days will be spent working from home. Now, so what that says is these are high wage people working in expensive places who will now be working from home. Well, here's from another paper. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, let me skip that. Here's from another paper by Bloom Davis and Zetskova that shows you innovation directed at work from home technologies. 
right? Then mention work from home. So basically, there's very little of this. You know, between January of 2010 and January 2020, about half of one percent of all patents mentioned working from home. In the in just in the first six months of 2020, that increases by 150 percent, from a half percentage point to one quarter percentage point. So that means that there's all this new innovation directed at working from home. We're going to think of this as very likely to be augmentation, right? And so what is that going to do? It's going to raise the demand for and the productivity of people who work from home. Well, who are those people? Those are already the highly educated, highly paid individuals uh, who were working from expensive offices. And so this process of changing your work will change what, who's in demand and what they do. And this will be a biased technical change induced by the pandemic that will likely be complementary to highly skilled workers and work further to their advantage. So uh, and that is obviously both good and bad properties. So let me conclude. Um, so you know we like to say uh, you know that that new, that new work is kind of the dark matter of the task universe. You know people think it's important, but they don't know you know where it comes from or what's in it or what it actually does. So that's what we tried to measure here. Uh, new work is quantitatively important. Explains about two thirds. It accounts for about two thirds of all employment ads in the last eighty years. Um, uh, uh, and this you know, that had been estimated previously, and we, we corroborate that. Um, the locus and skill content of new work has changed over eight decades. In the first four decades after World uh, World War II, it was creating new demand for middle skill activities in production and offices. In the most recent four decades. For college workers, it's pushed ever further to the right. And for non-college workers, it's pushed towards low paid personal services. Um, we see that uh, both augmentation innovations and shifts in labor demand predict where new work emerges, right? It consistently emerges where things are being augmented or where labor demand is growing for demographic reasons. Um, and so we can predict the emergence of new work. And then most importantly, uh, task displacement and new task creation, so augmentation and automation, they occur simultaneously in the same places, same occupations, but they have opposing consequences for employment and wage growth. So in thinking about how technological change is changing the work, we want to be thinking about both sides of the ledger, ledger, both the replacement or substitution of tasks by automation and how and where innovation is creating new demand for human expertise and skills and earnings opportunities. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, that was uh, really great, very interesting. I think it's a uh, very important, and I we obviously can see uh, the importance of uh, this exercise, this uh, uh, research uh, in terms uh, of policy, because if we can predict uh, how uh, New, uh, New York and uh, since New York can have positive impact of employment, we can also help it uh, with uh, instruments that we have in our hands in order to be more effective and develop more effective. So and, and not just predict it, but also shape where it occurs. Exactly. That is very important. And uh, therefore, this augmentation uh, channel, which has been so important uh, in the last uh, eight years that uh, as you illustrated, uh, could be uh, could provide important lessons, and I'm sure that uh, you are already thinking for other questions to use this data because it, I believe it can lead to many fascinating and important, uh, helpful results for policy. Uh, so, Martin, having seen uh, this research, uh, having been an expert by yourself, uh, what are your thoughts on this paper and on the policy implication it has? Yeah, so, so thank you, um, Georgios, for, for um, having me. And I would like to start by uh, congratulating David and, and his co-authors for uh, the work that David presented today, uh, at least since the 1970s, academics and, and also policymakers um, have been very concerned about um, the quality of jobs that are disappearing and uh, also being created. However, I don't think we have made a lot of progress in, in answering this question um, until today. So um, again, con congratulations to, to this very uh, extensive uh, piece of work. And I'm sure that it will um, result in a, in a revival of the job quality debate, uh, both among scientists and, um, and academics. So I um, 
and policymakers. So I'll um, so I was asked to I'm sharing my screen here. Sorry, let me check. So um, I was asked to kind of take a step back and um, think about there we go. And to, so to think about, you know, what are the, the broad messages from um, the research that David has presented today um, and, and what are the policy implications? And I'm going to want to tackle three questions. So what do we need? What do we know? And what can we do um, when thinking about this race between automation and, and, and augmentation uh, that David um, talked about. And so what do we need? I think first and foremost, we need a better understanding of uh, today's race between automation and new job creation. And this is exactly where David, Anna and Brian's work is, is absolutely key. Uh, then I'm gonna argue that um, you know, history suggests that broadly shared benefits um, from technological progress among workers are possible, but that also depends on institutional changes. Um, that were that were very often hard political battles, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what these policy changes were um, and, and are today. So uh, this slide shows you two pictures of the same place. It's the Place Royale in Brussels, which um, many of you um, might know because it's very close to the, the Bruegel offices, um, or you know you might not remember this place anymore, given that you've been um, working remotely for for so long now. Um, but anyway, let's go back to this place uh, in 1890, um, which was an episode of um, you know, the first industrial revolution in Belgium, and think of that as, as the, the steam engine revolution, which started around uh, 1800 and lasted for about 100 years to 1900. And what I'm going to argue that is that you know, during the, the, um, the second um, part of, of the, the first industrial revolution, so you know, between uh, 1846 and, and 1896, um, in net, the, the augmentation um, won that race between automation and augmentation in the sense that it seems that technological progress at that time um, was increasing the, the wages of workers in all sectors of uh, the Belgian economy. And to illustrate that, what I'm going to show you is some data from um, the 1846 and the 1896 um, industrial census. And uh, so what you see here on the vertical axis are uh, the average daily wages uh, across sectors of the Belgian economy. Um, the blue dot is the um, average daily wage in 1846. The green dot is in 1896. And what you clearly see is that over this 50 year period, um, wages grew in, in all sectors that we observe in um, our industrial census. What you also see uh, is that the relative wages um, didn't change much. So there wasn't much of a change in wage inequality, but there was wage growth uh, for workers in, in each of these sectors of the um, Belgian economy. Now, you know, there's what this suggests is that, you know, wage growth means that labor was scarce or became scarce. Um, and there's really two sources that can drive that, that scarcity. The first source is that, you know, there was a fall in, in labor supply across all the sectors. Um, which would you know, coincide with a fall in employment in each of these sectors. The second source could be that there was an, an increase in labor demand in each of these sectors, which would coincide with an increase in employment in each of these sectors. And so when you look at employment, um, so now I'm showing you um, a headcount of persons employed in each of these sectors, both blue is uh, 1846, green is 1896. Uh, what you see is that employment rose in, in each of these sectors which suggests that you know, it was a demand shift that was increasing both wages and employment in each of these sectors. And what we argue in this paper is that um, it was a steam engine. So the broad adoption of steam engine and falling um, capital prices um, that was resulting in um, technological progress, uh, making the wages of each of these workers uh, in each of these sectors grow over time. So in summary, you know, what, we, what we argue, of what, we sh what we see in, in, in uh, this episode of, um, of time was that um, you know, technological progress was augmenting uh, for all workers in the economy, at least for the average worker um, in uh, each of these sectors that we observe in our census. Now, you know, there is a consistent way to kind of interpret the facts that I've just shown you um, 
which is a recent paper by um, Gasselli and Manning. Um, and you know they it's a formal model and they build on other theories that you know David has and, and some, some other people have recently developed. And the point I want to make here is that um, we've we've also made a lot of, of progress in terms of thinking about how uh, the theories that we've developed in, in thinking about how technology affects um, workers. And that's important because you know we, we want consistency in our logic. Um, and we also want to come to uh, propositions that are falsifiable. And I think, you know, besides the, the, the empirical work that David has highlighted, um, I also uh, think it's important to, to remember that there's a lot of, of, of progress being made on, in terms of the theories. Now, rather than, um, you know, diving into the Caselli Manning kind of mathematical assumptions, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate their um, assumptions to uh, institutional changes that happened in the second half of the 19th century that kind of were playing together to to make sure that this that augmentation was winning this this race um, um, in, in in lifting the boats of all workers in, in the labor market the first one is uh, the first assumption is the broad implementation of steam engines at, at falling capital prices um, the second um, important change was that um, gradually over this 50 year period, both product and labor markets were becoming more competitive. Um, the third and the fourth point relate to uh, worker mobility. So uh, the idea that workers uh, could move to occupations where um, demand was rising, also through investment in schooling and geographic mobility. And then finally, even though unions didn't exist yet uh, before 1900, um, there was this, this increasing um, uh, importance of workers' voices um, in, in, in society. Now, so all these five kind of policy changes or, or institutional changes were working together to um, making sure that augmentation was winning this race from, from automation. Um, and, and I'll get back to that because I'm also going to talk about these five policy areas um, today and challenges today. But if you dive into the historical literature, what you'll also find is that many of these changes were very hard uh, political battles. So fat, uh, moving uh, to 2021, um, you know, that's the digital revolution starting around 1980. Um, I'm also giving it a lifespan of about you know, 100 years uh, and we're 40 years in. Now, you know, as David already mentioned in his talk, it, so the evidence that we've accumulated so far about the impact of the digital revolution on the labor market seems to be that you know it doesn't seem to be augmenting for all workers. Um, and you know there's several pieces of evidence. I think this is um, a very famous piece of evidence. It's David's fanning out graph showing that um, for uh, US workers, men and women, the wage levels for um, uneducated men or less educated men um, have actually are actually lower have fallen so are lower in 2017 than they were in 1980 um, and you know that's suggestive of the idea that technological progress isn't lifting the boats of all workers um, in in uh, the economy uh, in contrast to what happened in in the second half of the first industrial revolution there's other pieces of evidence david talked about job polarization that's not just the us but also an eu phenomenon so you know all in all it seems to be the case that you know the digital revolution so far has not been um, um, you know, increasing the wages of all workers, and keeping inequality constant, as was the case um, in the second half of the 19th century in Belgium. But um, you know, wages have been falling, wage inequality has been um, rising, and that poses the question: So, what do we need? What do we need, and, and what can we do? And I think what we need is first and foremost, we need a better understanding of how digital technologies displace workers and create new jobs. We think of it as good careers. Uh, and I think this, again, this is where David, Anna and Brian's work is, is absolutely fundamental. Um, a, a second, um, you know, what we also need is a, a change of priorities um, and a new approach that is using digital te technologies to augment jobs. Um, and as a comparison, today we, we you know there's a lot of focus on climate change, such as the European Green Deal, where you know we think about how can we use digital technologies to save on resources. I think we should have a similar approach where we um, think about how we can use digital technologies to to augment um, to augment jobs. 
So how can we do that? And here I'm gonna kind of go back to the five policy areas that were so successful um, in um, the, the, the second half of the 19th century. Um, first of all, you know, of course we need to support innovation, um, but we also need to direct technologies to be inclusive. And I think, you know, D David already alluded to that. Um, you know, how, so we have to think about how can we influence um, how new jobs are created, how new jobs are, are, are automated. Um, and it's not just about, you know, the automation of work. Uh, inclusive technologies also means that we have to think about data privacy. We have to think about how AI can, can manipulate our behavior, the opacity of AI systems, uh, worker robot interactions, etc. Second, um, th there is evidence that uh, since the 1980s, uh, markets or product and labor markets are becoming less competitive, not more competitive. Um, the, the, there is a skills question. So you know, the question about skill shortages and the skills gap, uh, why don't we invest in, in the skills if there's so many skill shortages? What skills should we invest in? Um, and also geographic mobility. I think there's a bit of evidence that shows that geographic mobility in Europe is still less than it is across states uh, in the US. And then finally, since 1980, um, union coverage, for example, has been declining in, in many European countries. So we have to kind of think about how can we redefine labor relations uh, to make sure that technological progress is going to lift all boats of all workers in the economy. Now, you know, and you know, these five policy areas, it, it just seems that we're some, some distance away from where we should be. Um, and uh, again, you know, this is going to be um, this is going to involve some, some pretty hard political battles to get uh, these policies turned around or at least not uh, continue to go in, in the wrong direction. Now, let me end by saying that I'm, I'm not a um, technology pessimist. So, for example, I don't think we're anywhere near a world of singularity. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about job creation policies if I think that robots can do these jobs more efficiently anytime soon. But, but I do think that um, we're, we're still some distance away from um, having you know, these five policy areas working together um, to make sure that um, the digital revolution is going to be uh, broadly shared, or the benefits of the digital revolution are going to be broadly shared um, across workers in, in the labor market. So um, thank you. That, that's um, my contribution. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, let me uh, remind uh, to the audience that um, they should feel very welcome to ask questions. And thanks uh, to the ones uh, that they already submitted their questions. We are going to discuss them uh, later in the panel discussion. But before that, let me go to Barbara. Barbara, we hear that augmentation is something we observe. So the, there are positive impact of technology, uh, both on employment, on wages, but um, we need also to think of, of the overall framework, which we need to consider and design in order to make uh, the positive impact of technology uh, to be the one that prevails and to create more efficient markets and better standards of living. So what are your thoughts? Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, first of all, to Brugel for inviting me. And I would also, like Martin, congratulate David and his colleagues for an excellent paper. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, luckily, we had a holiday yesterday, so I had some more time to read the paper. Um, I, um, I think, I mean, I would be happy if we had at the EU level the same kind of long 80 uh, years uh, data that you have. It's an extremely rich data, and I think you really did an amazing job uh, with it, also showing how in the uh, second half of this, uh, these 80 years uh, uh, segmentation uh, has been uh, really the predominant uh, theme, whereas before that was not uh, happening. And I also think that the paper makes a key contribution um, to clarifying what drives new work, um, first by spelling out clearly how the two often parallel um, effects of innovation, creating and displacing tasks, tend to have different impacts on new tasks and employment. And second, also by bringing 
in the changes in market size, which I think are also very important, or demand shocks to help us better understand uh, the developments that we have seen. And, and, and I think it also creates a lot of food for thought for the future. Now, uh, I, in the intervention that I want to make, I will do uh, three things. First, I talk a little bit about uh, developments at the EU level. Of course, we don't have this kind of impressive database, but still. And I think also in this context, I want to ask the question to what extent the green and the digital transitions in the COVID crisis may uh, have some impact on the trajectory that we are observing and uh, could have expected to continue. And then also I would like to discuss the policy implications that the technological change and new work patterns have in terms of innovation and employment, in terms of skills, in terms of working conditions and social protection. And then finally, uh, refer to some EU initiatives uh, that we have in place already or are being planned. So now looking at, at the past and looking rather at the last two decades, uh, I have to say that we have observed a similar pattern in, in, in Europe, in the EU, and even you and some of uh, the other authors with whom you have worked have, have shown in some cases that indeed the share of employment and occupation in the middle of the skills distribution has declined, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe and uh, that uh, the share of employment at the upper and lower ends has uh, increased substantially. And also in our uh, flagship report called EST, Employment Social Developments in Europe, for instance, in 2018, we showed that actually for every single EU member state, such a polarization can be observed, new tasks at the upper end and more jobs in services at the lower end. And in fact, I think very similarly to what you observe in the US in terms of a rapidly aging population requiring more people in uh, care services, this is something that we have uh, seen too. Uh, when I look at the current junc junction, what lies ahead uh, in terms of uh, green deal and digital transitions as key uh, forces, but also globalization and demographic change, uh, I think these are all uh, elements that we have to take into account. And uh, I think, uh, indeed, uh, often people are concerned about um, the job destruction or the jobs that disappear. But I'd also like to say that, in fact, when we look at this, we see on the one hand, maybe 400,000 mining jobs at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, uh, in question and slowly but surely disappearing. But at the same time, when we make projections, we think maybe uh, by 2050, we might have 2 million more uh, jobs in the EU, just thanks to the transition, the green transition. This is in net terms, of course, and also by 2030, 1.2 uh, million. So uh, what I think is also relevant here is that to us, at least the research we have done so far, when it comes to the green transition uh, differently from others, we feel that actually the kind of uh, uh, jobs uh, that will be created in construction, renewable energy production, sustainable transport, and so on, are actually middle skill. And for the time being, our expectations are that actually this may be one factor, the green transition, that could actually, to some extent, mitigate the uh, segmentation or the polarization that is going on. Another element, you also mentioned it already, is the COVID crisis. Here, uh, we also feel that uh, actually, in some ways now, this is uh, a shock in a way, and it has accelerated. Uh, the way uh, people work. And uh, I think uh, this will also bring with it substantial consumer behavior. For instance, uh, what we are seeing now in terms of uh, airline industry, maybe the combination of the green and the COVID will mean that we will never get quite back to where we were in terms of traveling and so on. Um, now, coming to the policy implications, um, I would like to mention innovation, employment, skills formation, and working conditions, social dialogue. And when it comes to the innovation, I mean, I, I, I read with interest the work that you did on patents. And one of the things that came to my mind, and I looked at the numbers again, is that basically in Europe, we have one fifth of the number of patents that 
there are in the US, some 250,000 in the US, uh, 50,000 in, uh, in, in, in Europe on average. And I think right here, you see that we have still a lot of work to do in terms of stimulating uh, this innovation. I actually believe that um, uh, the green and the digital transitions could be one of the elements that will affect uh, companies in terms of providing new incentives to be more innovative. And uh, uh, so I, I also agree uh, with uh, uh, Martin that competition policy is a key element to also keep uh, the, the innovation going. Uh, then in terms of uh, skills, I think we all agree that uh, further development of skills is key. I might uh, want to say that uh, we have recently uh, at the social summit in uh, Porto, leaders agreed on new targets, an employment target, 78% by 2030, a skills target, 60% of adults should be in training uh, every year uh, by 2030. So that's a very ambitious target. And then there's also a poverty target of minus 15. Um, and uh, basically, I think we all know that uh, in terms of uh, skills, uh, the, the kind of skills we need today, partly specific, but also partly transversal, digital uh, are key. And I think also the education and training systems nowadays are very much challenged because not only do they have to think of possible future uh, jobs that don't exist uh, even right now, but even uh, it's it's rather difficult to keep up with, uh, with the trends. Now, uh, uh, then I also said that I wanted to say a few words about uh, the social dimension that also Martin uh, mentioned. And I think here indeed, we have to pay a lot of attention to, uh, to quality jobs, to wages, in terms of social security, in terms of social dialogue in order to make sure that uh, with these uh, transformations, uh, we, uh, we also uh, get the right uh, conditions for, for people. And that's uh, where I finally come in with the commission plans and initiatives. Uh, I would say on the one hand, big initiatives supporting structural change. I mentioned already the Green Deal, large actions, uh, digital agenda, infrastructure projects, and there's a huge array of funds, including the 1.8 trillion uh, new budget, but also Horizon Europe uh, program that looks more at a better take up nowadays uh, in terms of uh, innovation. And then on the other hand, next to that, and maybe let me say this uh, part of funding also the recover and resilience facilities, because they're specifically trying to get member states into the green and digital um, um, uh, reform. And then next to it, let me finally mention also the pillar of social rights, um, where uh, in uh, Porto, member states uh, and uh, EU leaders more generally have agreed to a whole action plan in order to uh, provide upward social uh, convergence on the one hand and just provide this counterweight to the digital and green uh, transitions in terms of better um, equal opportunities and access to the labor market. Let me just give one example, the ease uh, recommendation, which says we have to help people not only keep them in jobs where they are, but help them into new jobs uh, through a better uh, active labor market policy skills and uh, public employment services. Uh, then let me also mention the uh, fair working conditions area where we have put forward last uh, year a minimum wage uh, proposal a framework for the EU and uh, are currently consulting uh, social partners on uh, a platform um, initiative. And uh, let me then uh, finally also mention again the social protection and inclusion aspect, because here we just have to be sure that everybody has access to social protection and uh, we are not uh, sort of, nobody is falling behind. So I think I have to stop here now, but I'm ready, of course, to come back to that. But again, thank you very much for an uh, excellent paper and a lot of food for thought. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I want to come back to you, David, uh, if you want uh, to reflect to some po the, the points Martin and Barbara mentioned. Uh, just uh, two questions on the top of that. I mean, uh, 
Martin uh, made a clear point of uh, steam engine, uh, which is which uh, by definition was a, a general purpose technology. Uh, so, uh, how important do you see such a general purpose technologies like computerization being another, which is within uh, your data set uh, for realizing this augmentation uh, impact of technology? And the second that goes a little bit also to what Barbara mentioned, if we move away from US uh, where innovation pace is not so high, would that be, um, uh, is innovation so important for realizing this augmentation uh, effect and what we can do in other parts of the world? Should we have this policy direction to a more innovative, um, uh, innovative uh, pace uh, of doing business? Great, okay, um, thank you. Thank you for both of those discussions, which were terrific. Um, so on the, so this question about sort of STEAM versus digital and GPT, general purpose technologies and so on. I think, so I, I, don't, I, I neither want to be a technological determinist, nor do I want to be a person who's, who argues that technology has no relevance, it's all social choices, because I think it's some of both. So, um, I would say that the you know and the something you see in our data and it's documented in the paper is there's a you can really see three eras of innovation uh, in between 1900 and 2018 in the shape in the locus of patenting in kind of from 1900 to 1940 almost all patenting is basically in manufacturing processes uh, mining and transportation uh, and it's a kind of the era of the kind of industrial revolution. From kind of 1940 to 1980, you see a lot of growth in kind of chemical processes uh, and kind of high tech manufacturing. And you can think of this as kind of the age of better living through chemistry. Uh, and then from 1980 forward, there's really a clear break point uh, as we enter the information age. And by the end of our era, uh, two, more than 50% of patents are just in two sectors. Uh, one is in uh, instruments and information, and the other is electronics and computing. And I do think that the, you know, the information age, obviously it was, you know, is brought about by investments, a lot of them military investments, right? Turing's work, you know, on the digital computer, the invention of the integrated circuit and telecommunications and so on. But ultimately we would have entered a digital age, right? If like humanity had been around for long enough, we would have discovered information processing, binary representation, computing as tools, and they would have changed the way we do work. And some of those characters are intrinsic because it's much easier as we move into an information age, it's, it's much work becomes more about information and less about physical activity. And we've managed to automate a lot of, you know, physical activity through, you know, use of technology and a lot of what is remaining is human cognition. And so I do think in the last four decades, um, or let's say in the first four decades after the uh, Second World War, the technology was a, as a kind of a tailwind pushing us towards creation of middle skill jobs. The growth of manufacturing, the growth of office work, right, were intrinsically ways to make people without very high levels of education highly productive. And as we move into the information age, those people became more substitutable. And the set of skills that became more complemented were ones that required abstract reasoning uh, and, and a lot of communication, right? Not just, it's not all just technological skills, but they were information skills. So I think that the, um, it is the case that the technology was working in our favor in the second world, during the Second World War and now has worked, you know, has been pushing in the opposite direction. But I do not think that's all of it at all. I absolutely think the institutions have changed. Maybe the institutions were, you know, swimming downstream before and now they're swimming upstream. Um, but we have a lot of choice. And if we look across the U.S. and Europe and so on, we see all of every country is dealing with technological change, globalization, uh, China's rise, uh, demographic pressures, but they produce very different outcomes in terms of levels of inequality, uh, employment to population rates, um, you know, and, and not without, and not by sacrificing growth, right? I don't look to Scandinavia and go, oh, well, those countries are working really well, but they, they've grown so slowly. Clearly that's not true. Um, so uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of role for policy and social choice to, to take this kind of bounty of innovation and turn it into a set of social outcomes. Um, is innovation itself important? Well, I do think that uh, investment is very important. And where you invest in a sector, you not only create more work, but you create new work. You don't have to be at the frontier. You don't have to necessarily be the ones creating the patents to do that, but you have to be deploying the thing. So, you know, I don't, 
even if the solar cells are, you know, produced in China, there will be a tremendous amount of innovation associated with, you know, changing over the power grid in terms of all of the deployments and all of the investment. So I'm increasingly of the view, right, before I did this project, I would have just said, well, you can create more jobs, but, you know, they're just temporary, blah, blah. Now I actually think where you make these investments, you don't just create more, you create new. And that itself has its own advantages. So I think innovation is our ally as well as our enemy. And it's our ally to the degree that we shape it. And we should not, the future is not something that we sit around and try to predict and then adjust to what's going to happen. The future is something that we create. And the view that it's going to happen to us is a choice about what happens. The view that we can shape it is also a choice about what's going to happen. And they have different implications. So we should be steering innovation and investment in the direction uh, that we want to see growth, where we want to see new employment, where we want to see opportunity. I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I can uh, go through the questions. We have many questions, actually, unless Martin and Barbara want to add uh, something. OK, so uh, let me start uh, with uh, you, David. So innovation is important and uh, for creating this uh, agglomeration effect, as you mentioned. But uh, uh, Robert uh, Coleman is asking, um, as the task set increases through the new job creation, uh, many of the, the new tasks will be so sophisticated and cogni uh, cognitively demanding that many people in the end will not be able to handle them. Is this the case? Or will reach a point that uh, this channel will not work anymore? Uh, it's a really good question. Of course, I, you know, I, I can, can't answer with any certainty, but my sense is that um, uh, not necessarily. So first of all, we see a lot of new task creation in things that are not highly educated, right? A lot of them are in personal services, right? So you have, you know, yoga teachers uh, and sommeliers and uh, people who, you know, are entertainers and so on. And these are not highly, highly educated, right? Uh, they are, they still require expertise, those and, and investment and so on, but it's not about, you know, you need a PhD in this or that. Um, and even at the high end, and this is work, you know, the David Deming of Harvard has done, right? A lot of the growth of new work is in work that combines their technical skill and interpersonal skill, right? It's not just, you know, can you, you know, what, you know, computationally hard problem can you solve? It's how do you translate from a body of expertise to, you know, communicating with a patient or leading a team or making an argument or a presentation. So a lot of the human, so I think a lot of the, you know, it's not, it's not kind of technical skills or you know soft skills. It's that these things are complementary. So I, I don't think, obviously, there are going to be some you know highly highly educated tasks. And it is the case that a lot of the growth in return to education is among people with post college degrees. So it's complicated. But I don't think we're putting expertise out of reach out of reach of everyone, but the most uh, uh, you know the the most um, elite. Uh, that's not my sense. Clear. Um, there are some questions about um, uh, the singularity you mentioned, Martin. Um, and actually, that is questions for all, but let me start with you. So is there any timeline of um, technology advanced so much so we'll be able to replace high skill jobs uh, and will be a real threat? Um, do you see this happening? Uh, and um, any views on that? Well, that's, that's a... A, a, a very difficult question. I mean, David, one of David's occupations was a clairvoyant, and I'm, I'm certainly not able to look into the future, so I'm, I'm not in that cell. Um, so, so the, the way I think about singularity is it's 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 not necessarily as a zero one. So you can think about singularity as this this extreme uh, version of of technology where all, it's all about automation. Um, and so I think a better way to think about singularity is to think about, you know, how much automation uh, of work uh, is there today? And, you know, and I, I think so, what, what evidence has been uh, suggesting is that, you know, there's, there's probably quite a bit of, of, of um, automation, but I think David's point then, then of, in, in his, his presentation today is that there's also augmentation. And uh, so you have these, these two margins. And I think singularity would just be you know, a, 
kind of like a world in which it's all automation and no augmentation of work. Um, and, you know, it's so from a personal experience, talking to people in, in, in you know, the, in the innovating communities, I don't think anyone thinks that, you know, we're, we're anywhere near, um, you know, the world in which, in which uh, there's singularity. Clear. Um, if anyone else wants to step in, feel free. Uh, otherwise, I will continue. And uh, there are some questions for Barbara, actually, uh, that refer uh, to educational policy, uh, lifelong learning policies, how important they can be uh, in order to uh, steer uh, this New York uh, and this uh, uh, make uh, this augmentation channel as the main one, uh, increasing jobs, wages, employment. And if you have any examples uh, from member states already that they have uh, implemented targeted educational policies in order to steer this uh, New York uh, uh, work uh, that is uh, developed. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I think just on the, on the uh, uh, point before, I, uh, I'm also no clear point, but just to also say that I think there will be also always a very important part also of interaction with people. So I cannot either see that, let's say the high skilled jobs will disappear completely. And in particular, as Martin already said, this combination of augmentation on the one hand together with the automation, I think will allow skilled uh, jobs to remain an important force. However, I would like to also say that of course, one can also think of a world with uh, fewer working hours. Right now we think uh, maybe still a bit of a job, yes, no, and, uh, and maybe you could also imagine a future where uh, there are these skilled jobs, but people work fewer hours. So I think that at least is part of thinking uh, uh, ahead. In terms of um, lifelong learning, I would have to, maybe I can do it in the context of this, um, uh, this session, uh, if I ask uh, colleagues who are more expert than myself. So I don't have an example right now of a particularly uh, good country to cite uh, in this respect, but I, I think, it is, it is totally clear from this continuous change of uh, uh, requirements on the technological side, from this uh, more and more rapid change between jobs that people uh, have uh, to experience compared to the past, that there's no other way than uh, to have uh, lifelong learning. So if uh, uh, we have... Uh, uh, the skills agenda at the EU level, then lifelong learning is a very important uh, part of that. And we are also reflecting on uh, things like uh, individual learning accounts. And there I can say there are already a few countries like France that are putting that into place uh, so in a way that every worker knows what to count on in terms of uh, training. Uh, so, um, I think this is something that will be even further uh, developed, but I would say we're already very much on it because there's no way uh, out that. And uh, as already mentioned, the 60% target of adult learning every year by 2030, uh, this is considered extremely high because we are not, you know, I think the intermediate target 2040 is I think 45%. And this is really a long way to go, but it also shows that uh, we have this commitment. But I think the question was also about education. And I think in, on the education side, what I may uh, want to add is that uh, what is very important is to have a better uh, understanding of what are the needs of the market to avoid that the education systems produce uh, uh, sort of outcomes that by the time they reach the market, it's already outdated. So a more updated, uh, skills, sort of uh, understanding of what is needed and uh, uh, training to uh, people to learn as they go through life. Thank you, Barbara. Um, next question has to do with inclusivity and uh, to be more specific, gender inclusivity. Um, we discussed a little bit uh, the educational uh, dimension. David, you, may, you saw that non-college workers uh, tend to go to New York 
uh, in low skill occupations, um, uh, while the educated ones, they focus on high skills. Uh, Martin also brought some, um, uh, some evidence that agree with that. If we go to the gender dimension, um, is this New York inclusive? Um, do, you, uh, do we know if uh, women are uh, disfavored by uh, their, uh, in, uh, their location in these new jobs? Um, are there any evidence probably beyond your current research? Do you have any, um, anything to say on that? Sure. I mean, in, in many ways, the structure of uh, advanced economies has shifted to the comparative advantage of women. And we've certainly seen that in you know, women's rising education in which they have you know, exceeded men in every dimension um, and have you know, increased their representation in medicine, in law, in managerial work. However, that said, uh, it's still a case that in many uh, occupations, the top echelons are uh, populated disproportionately by men and especially in the tech fields. Uh, and I think that's problematic, um, and, I, and I don't think it's intrinsic. Uh, and it, so I think there's a lot of cultural, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done to change that outcome. And I don't think that's a, you know, a, a uh, you know, the natural quote state of affairs. Um, so uh, I don't, so I don't think there's any sense in which the evolution of work is disadvantageous to women. Uh, in many ways, many people would argue just the opposite, that if, you know, if men historically, at least, and we don't know how much of this is intrinsic pedestrian, has it have a preference for physical work or non-social work, there's less of that to do. And more of the work is definitely going to be a cognitive and interpersonal. Um, so there's, you know, I think the, the greater barriers to women's work, in addition to sort of just, you know, preconceived notions is the structure of households and expectations around child rearing and career interruption and so on. And uh, I hope we can do, I mean, it's, there are many ways one could do better on that. But one possibility is that the change in, na in the in physical presence and the rise of telepresence and the changing structures around that may actually create additional flexibility, right? Which would be beneficial to everyone, uh, possibly. Right, you know, we are changing our norms about where you need to be. <laughs> I can see Barbara's already, uh, which is great. Anyway, so let me just say, we're changing our norms about whether where you need to be and when you need to be there. And maybe that we can, I'm not saying that solves any problems, but it creates possibilities that could be used productively. Although in the short run, of course, the pandemic has been disadvantageous to women, not advantageous. I'll stop there. Bar I know I see Barbara wants to jump right in. Yes, Please. So if, I, if I can, uh, I mean, uh... I mean, first, I wanted to make the point that we have also seen, at least in Europe, that uh, when it comes to STEM, that the women are not yet uh, sufficiently taking up these, uh, these topics, and it's something that we're trying uh, to push. Um, I'd also like to say that, uh, as such, uh, we find it quite amazing if we look at the data and the education outcome in, in Europe, in member states, women tend to be better. Uh, so that, that's why it is all the more uh, amazing than when you look at the labor market, the representation on the one hand, but also the pay gap, uh, that there's a real issue that needs to uh, be overcome. And uh, you, you're right, some will be linked to uh, culture. I think child care facilities is something that we are pushing. In a few member states, we still have a problem with taxation, double income and so on. And, uh, uh, and right now, there's now also recently an initiative by the Commission on, on, on paid transparency. No, I was just reacting a bit to, to you, David, because I, I know I've seen a lot of reports about how the fact that children did homeschooling kind of uh, burdened women disproportionately and were, how people already started to say that it might even affect them in their careers because uh, somehow they take uh, the the biggest burden and that's why i mean under normal circumstances you know i mean uh, uh, if children are working from school then maybe teleworking can be uh, uh, better but uh, for this proviso so thank you to both um a question for martin uh, whether you can expand uh, on the fact that uh, labor markets become uh, became less competitive and how we can improve that 
Yeah, so so um, I think there's quite there's more evidence that that our product markets are becoming less competitive, but there's also some some indications that uh, monopsony power has has increased over time, um, and so monopsony power is is the idea that employers have have power over their workers, not over their their um, consumers, and I think one um, very sp specific example of that could be um, the platform workers. So um, before this meeting, there was actually also an interview with um, the commissioner. Um, and he talked a lot about um, platforms and platform workers. And I think that's a very um, specific type of work. I mean, it, it, it's 10% of, um, at most 10% of total employment um, is on platforms. So it's, it's not, you know, there's still the other 90%. But th those platform workers, I think, are um, you know, there's also rising evidence that um, platform workers are, um, on the one hand, you know, pl these platforms offer opportunities and it makes you know the labor market in a way more efficient. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also um, increasing evidence that there's monopsony power on those platforms. Um, that you know, in the way in which those platform makers um, are um, using, for example, labor law to um, uh, to the disadvantage of 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 the workers using those platforms, and I think these are very genuine concerns. And it's just one example where I think you know um, it's a real concern on on you know as we see the number of platforms rising and the platform um, populations who works on platforms uh, rising um, that not only um, we we might increase efficiency on the labor market uh, create jobs but that also comes at the expense of um, lower wages for workers and I think that's one clear example where where you see that, that there there's if anything um, less competition on the labor market uh, rather than more. Great. Um, very, there are some questions about um, uh, David, Anna's, and Brian's paper. This is still a work in progress. Where it will become available when it will be completed. And I guess uh, the interested people can find it at David's website, right, David? Yeah, and uh, Anna's and uh, uh, Brian's as well. But yeah, it, unfortunately, we're it, we, still in progress. We will definitely have it uh, we'll release it uh, this summer before before mid July. So and I apologize so long. I, I feel I do. Uh, I I'm embarrassed that it's not out yet, but uh, hopefully it'll be worth wait. Uh, great. Um, I mean, we have um, less than two minutes uh, to conclude. Um, I want I can either ask a final question or uh, um, if you want to mention something, an overall point uh, of a conclusion, feel very welcome to do that. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, please, Barbara. Maybe it's not so much an overall point, but a reaction to Martin. And uh, basically, he mentioned platform work. And uh, I wanted to mention in, in this context that, OK, yes, platform workers are then often not considered workers but rather self-employed. And the commission is currently looking at the question of whether to allow such self-employed platform workers uh, to be able to cooperate uh, while uh, this normally would not be allowed by competition policy. But this is something that has to be, that is currently being looked at in order to help uh, platform workers to defend their rights. And the other thing that I also want to mention is that in the context of the minimum wage uh, proposal, actually part of this recommendation, uh, or not recommendation, a proposal on a directive to be precise, is also about uh, boosting collective bargaining, because we think that this would be a way to, uh, you know, strengthen uh, the interests also of the workers. Uh, but I, I think that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, thanks a lot to all the three of you. That was uh, really fascinating. Thanks a lot for your contribution. Great paper, uh, David. Uh, great insights uh, by Martin and Barbara. Uh, I hope uh, uh, our audience enjoyed it. And um, certainly, I learn much more and uh, I have some research question formed out of that. Thanks to, you, to all of you for being here and uh, continue the great research and the great policy work. We need both. Take care. Thanks Thank to all you. three of you. Thanks, Bruegel, for uh, inviting us. This is terrific.